Fox at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A soggy start to the new week, making a blustery transition. We're talking a cold front with a chance for some rain and some strong winds. Meteorologist Adam Kasky tracking the timing of all of this. So, Adam, what are we watching for first here? Well, a cold front's going to arrive later on tonight around 10 o'clock locally and with it a few storms developing. Not a whole lot in terms of coverage, only about 30% of our area likely to get hit. And that's between about 9 p.m. To midnight can rule out a rogue severe thunderstorm. There's that possibility. We could have one or two storms become severe with straight line gusty winds up to about 60 miles per hour. But the main headline going forward more so than the thunderstorm potential tonight. Very windy later tonight and tomorrow completely unrelated to thunderstorms. Non thunderstorm gusts between 50 and 60 miles per hour late tonight and through sunrise tomorrow morning. Here's the big picture and you can see a wound up low pressure system with this counterclockwise circulation over the panhandle areas of beneficial rain associated with it, but also some severe thunderstorms just east of San Angelo right now. That's out ahead of the cold front that's headed our way and for us. 30% chance from 9 p.m. to midnight with, I think, pretty minimal accumulations for most. Coming up in a little bit, we'll take a look at the future cast and dive deeper into just how gusty it's going to be and when in just a bit. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, Adam. Across the country, hospitals are filling up with children fighting respiratory illnesses. We're seeing it here in San Antonio. Local hospitals facing rising numbers of the flu rhinovirus and RSV. Max Massey sat down with a local mother who explains what happened to her child and what she now wants to share with other parents. You're still a mom and your heart always goes to your child first. She scared me. Lori is a mom of three and her youngest, her five month old, her daughter. Well, she had a cough that escalated to being so much more it ended up being RSV. And then that's when she kind of just started to rapidly decline by about 11 a.m. She wasn't really eating anymore. And then what she did eat was all coming right back up from home care to urgent care to having to go to the emergency room. But when she started to get most of the symptoms from the virus, she went down very quickly. So um, I brought her here and they put her on oxygen and decided to keep her. The illness just wouldn't back down. After they admitted her, she kept getting worse and worse. It's a situation families across the country are now facing. It's a national issue. A lot of the hospitals are dealing with a high number of pediatric cases. And so we actually have conversations about how to collaborate amongst the hospitals locally. But nationally, it's a problem because, again, children are getting sick uh, and many of those are being hospitalized. Finally, this five month old was able to breathe on her own. She left the hospital. That didn't mean the battle was over. If she gets worse again, bring her back because she's not on oxygen anymore. So after two weeks, five month old Ariella was better. For babies, it can be very, very detrimental um, because they don't have the immune system that we have and they don't have the reserve that we have as far as respiratory system goes. RSV can be a terrifying situation for any family, but it's not the only respiratory illness that are filling up hospitals. Really? Try to do the best you can to get your vaccine for influenza. That's critical uh, and probably the first line of defense. Right now, local hospitals are reporting high numbers of flu cases. And as winter months approach, they're urging people to get the flu shot as a precaution. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. The race for Bear County judge getting more tense as early voting kicked off today. That's after comments made earlier this month by Republican candidate, former County Commissioner Trish DeBerry about her opponent, Democratic candidate Judge Peter Sakai. DeBerry referred to Sakai as Dr. No during a forum with the Bear County Deputy Sheriff's Association. During that exchange, Sakai asked for clarification on what she meant about the James Bond villain reference. Take a look. Reference to Dr. No means what? You said no to the Bear County Jail and moving it out of the west side. You said no to a downtown baseball stadium. You won't even entertain the idea. And you talk about So why can't you call me Peter minute, or Judge Sakai? I take offense to Dr. No. Today, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance released a statement claiming DeBerry used the name as a racial reference because the character is an Asian villain. Trish DeBerry has since responded, saying in part, quote, I don't think about Peter's race in any policy debate or interaction. It's off limits and irrelevant. I focus on his total opposition to bold ideas that move this county forward, end quote.
Now, in a statement, Sakai has responded, saying in part the statements from the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, quote, capture the hurt caused by my opponents and sensitive remarks. I've committed to running a positive campaign, and I've honored that commitment to not engage in name calling, name calling rather, end quote, end quote. To read both candidates' full statements, you can go to our website, ksat.com. There we go. Speaking of the elections, the first day of early voting is done. Polls open for the midterm election today and will stay open through November 4th. Garrett Berger out talking with voters earlier today about what brought them out. He joins us live now from Lions Field, or maybe I should call it Lions Field, just for early voting. Garrett, what are you seeing out there? <laughs> well, not lines anymore, Steve. At 6 o'clock is when the polls officially closed, and we did... If you uh, are in line, though, you are still able to vote. And we watched someone walk in that door behind me just before 6 o'clock, and presumably they are still in line inside. But when we were here earlier this afternoon, that name would have been apt. The line stretched out halfway around the front of the building, and it is a long ballot, though, with federal, state, county, and numerous judgeship races. And there's no longer any straight ticket voting, so you have to make an individual decision on all of the races. Still, as of the latest count from elections officials a few hours ago, or just under two hours ago, we had 26,000 voters who had cast a ballot today. One of them, Sylvia Alcaraz, who takes her civic duty very seriously, making sure to bring her adult son and his girlfriend with her, too. So when I became a citizen here and I was able to vote, that was very important to me. And it's very important that for me that the younger generations do it as well because it's a right that a lot of people fought for. And so the least we can do is just get in line and, and vote and, and just exercise that privilege. There are 51 early voting locations all throughout the county, and you are able to cast your ballot at any one of them. We have more information on where you can find those locations and when they're in operation on our website, ksat.com. Now, early voting will continue through November 4th. That gives you 11 more days to cast your ballot, plus Election Day itself on November 8th. Live at Lions Field, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. There are absolutely misconceptions about the Latino vote. It doesn't mean what it used to mean. We now have a voice, and it's a very powerful voice. KSAT explains the Latino vote. That phrase is key every election cycle. But are there misconceptions about what the Latino vote is or what it means? Some of our own KSAT crew stepping into our breakdown booth to share their thoughts. Plus, we're introducing you to some local voters who are sending a message as this election gets underway. KSAT explains still ahead at 630. And if you scan this QR code right now, it's going to take you to our website where we have an article breaking down all the important information you need to know about early voting and some of the important races as well. To other news now at six, a man convicted of murder apologizing. Not enough for the family of the woman he killed. Gregory Morrison today sentenced to 28 years for the 2020 murder of Anne Marie Black. Erica Hernandez was there for the powerful statements from a grieving sister and daughter. I'd like to offer my condolences to everyone that was affected by this. You know, I, I know it was a horrible thing, and, and if I could go back and undo it, I, I would undo it. Gregory Morrison apologizing during his sentencing hearing today and asking for leniency after taking a plea deal for the November 2020 murder of Anne Marie Black. Black was shot four times by Morrison outside a Pilot Flying J truck stop near Foster Road after a confrontation over money. The family wanted 30 years, and Morrison asked for 20 years. 187th District Court Judge Stephanie Boyd gave him 28 years. He took such a beautiful soul, and I know I will never understand or try to understand why you did what you did. Black's daughter and sister facing Morrison after he was sentenced, not accepting his apology. I will not be giving you the pleasure of forgiving you. Not today and probably not ever. But don't sit here today and say you're sorry because your lawyer told you to because we know it's a lie. There's no remorse there. You're not sorry. You're just sorry you're getting in trouble. Of that 28 year sentences, Morrison must serve half before he's eligible for parole. At the Cadena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News.
Nearly four months after 53 migrants died in a smuggling attempt on Quintana Road, a local woman now honoring their memories through an altar. While the Day of the Dead altar features the faces of those migrants, it also memorializes the victims in Buffalo and in Uvalde. Alicia Barrera visited with the artist on her efforts to now work with the city to create something permanent. This is more than just an altar for me, Tim. This is the way I'm healing. 53 faces, printed, laminated, and framed. It is a visual impact for people. Multiple nationalities, but perhaps the same dream. To see not only the name on the crucifix, but to see a picture that resembles somebody like themselves or someone that they may even know. For the past two weeks, this is where community members come to honor the migrants discovered inside the trailer left on Quintana Road on June 27th with no AC and no escape. The reactions vary from having a, a gasp to crying. Dusty hats, weathered soles, and medical equipment used at the scene they're witnessing evidence, really, what it comes down to. These are the items found in and around the 18-wheeler. They're now placed in Ziploc bags and are displayed outside Casa Azul at the corner of Buena Vista and Las Mora Street. Her original vision was to have the altar here on Quintana Road. However, there's still no electricity or running water, and District 4 says they're still working on a plan. In a statement, District 4 Councilwoman Dr. Adriana Rocha Garcia said in part, Quote, discussions are ongoing across various departments and we will be including multiple stakeholders once we have more information. There are also several details that will need to be reviewed and considered with community input, end quote. Which is why grassroots efforts like Martinez's have continued to create spaces for those still grieving. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. A Bear County Sheriff's deputy could soon be without a job after her recent assault arrest, that alleged assault involving the off-duty deputy and her boyfriend. BCSO officials say the 29-year-old Angelica Flores got into a verbal argument with her boyfriend and it then became physical. She's accused of hitting him in the face with her elbow. BCSO officials say that she was a two-year veteran of the force and they have now started the termination process. This is the 14th deputy arrested this year. The San Antonio police are looking for a man accused of stabbing someone inside an HEB at the self-checkout kiosk yesterday. Police were called to the scene just before 2 p.m. at the location on Valley High Drive, not far from Springville Drive and Loop 410. The 30-year-old victim told police he was checking out when he was stabbed by someone unprovoked. The victim was taken to the hospital. One of two people killed in a hospital shooting in Dallas over the weekend has now been identified. 45-year-old Jacqueline Pokiwa. We're also getting a look at the accused shooter, 30-year-old Nestor Hernandez. He's now facing a capital murder charge. Now, this photo is from a prior arrest. Hernandez was at the hospital visiting his girlfriend who gave birth to their child. He was reportedly threatening to kill the woman and himself. When Pokiwa and another hospital employee entered the room, they were allegedly shot and killed by Hernandez. He was later shot by a hospital police officer and arrested. We're talking about the House of Representatives. There's a few seats needed to change the majority, and for the Senate, it takes just one. We're going to break down recent polls to get ahead of what we can expect in the midterm elections nationwide. The Texas Department of Public Safety responding now that the Robb Elementary School staff member falsely accused of propping open a door on that day is sharing her story, what they have to say about her retelling of what happened. Let's check out traffic on this Monday. Let's go to I-37 and Fair, and you can see things are moving along fairly well. <laughs> that Not works. great. That works. Yeah, a little slow going out there, but no major traffic tie-ups to tell you about. It's scary because there's always stuff going on, always, always going on. They're targeting crime in San Antonio by shining a light on some of the darkest neighborhoods. Who could benefit from the city's nearly $6 million streetlight program? Maybe your neighborhood. I'll tell you about it at 10. Plus, building a legacy for the Rob Elementary victims tonight on the night beat. The gift their families plan to share with Uvalde students in their honor. 
In less than 24 hours since the Robb Elementary School staff members spoke out, the Texas Department of Public Safety has released a statement. Amelia Marin was at the center of that accusation by DPS just days after the May 24th shooting that a teacher left a door propped open, which allowed the shooter to get into the school. DPS has since retracted that accusation. School surveillance video shows Marin kicking that rock away that was propping the door open and then closing the door before calling 911 after the shooter crashed his vehicle. In response to Marin's interview with ABC News, DPS officials said in part, quote, DPS corrected this error in public announcements and testimony and apologizes to the teacher and her family for the additional grief this has caused to an already horrific situation, end quote. Since that mass shooting, Manin has been dealing with body shakes, a stutter when she speaks, and she now suffers from anxiety and depression. I did die that day. I see the windows boarded up and the fence around the campus. I tell my counselor, I'm in there. I'm still in there. In recent weeks, there have been calls for more accountability from the Uvalde victims' families. The Uvalde CISD Police Department has been suspended entirely, and the Uvalde CISD Superintendent, Dr. Hal Harrell, has announced his retirement. Take a look at live cam right now, 617, 88 degrees. When will we start to notice the cool front, Adam Kasky? Uh, you're going to notice it after dark, just a few hours away from that cold front. I think locally San Antonio around 10 o'clock, give or take a little bit. And yes, I do anticipate some storms along that front tonight, but very limited coverage in terms of those storms. So not many of us really getting hit and very limited rainfall accumulations as well. The main headline here is very gusty non thunderstorm winds behind the cold front. Just how gusty? Well, let's take a look at this. Here's our forecast and this is for in and around San Antonio. Notice by 2 a.m. we're gusting to over 40 miles per hour, 6, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. We could have gusts in excess of 50 miles per hour early tomorrow morning and that's with a clear sky, baby blue sky, bright sunshine. So non thunderstorm wind gusts between 50 and 60 miles per hour. This could lead to a few power outages in some spots. Localized power outages are possible. And here's the other main headline with this. Be sure to secure your Halloween decorations tonight. Inflatables, keep them deflated overnight tonight and through the first half of the day tomorrow. And anything that could blow around or just become dislodged, you really want to bring it in or uh, secure it so it's uh, so it can withstand some of those 50 mile per hour wind gusts. Right now, not all that breezy out there, just that typical wind out of the south southeast at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. But notice it's starting to shift in parts of Valverde County. And as you get closer to Junction, that's the cold front that's headed our way. And here's our future cast. And what we did is we highlighted in red here, basically the hill country and areas where we'll likely have the highest wind gusts. This is our future cast for 7 a.m. Concan gusting to 54, San Antonio gusting to 51, New Braunfels gusting to 45, but you see many wind gusts in excess of 40 miles per hour once you get up into northwestern Bear County, northern Bear County, and then northward into parts of the hill country. And that's just at 7 a.m. We'll likely have similar gusts through 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and then the wind will gradually let off by the midday and afternoon. By one o'clock, still breezy and noticeable wind gusts up to about 25 miles per hour, but that's an improvement. And then the wind really subsides by tomorrow evening and tomorrow night. All right, let's talk rainfall just out ahead of the front. We're already seeing a few showers pop up in our area. We're talking northern Edwards County moving into Kimball County. This is just off of I-10, just south of I-10 in parts of the hill country. A little bit of lightning associated with that one cell. But that's it. I do want to point out this green line. That's actually the cold front moving into Valverde County. It's almost at Lake Amistad moving into Del Rio. It's kicking up uh, insects and uh, just little bits of debris out there, leaves and whatnot. And so the radar can detect that front as it moves in. All right, let's take a look at our future cast. And as I said, coverage pretty limited and accumulations minimal. 9, 10 o'clock, up and down I-35 locally and especially north closer to Austin. We'll likely have some thunderstorms, maybe even a severe storm. Better rain chances closer to the Gulf Coastline. We're talking Lavaca County, 
Gonzales, even down toward DeWitt County, the typical locations that usually do a little bit better uh, with these systems. So uh, overall, I don't anticipate much. I would be thrilled to even see half an inch of rain around town from this. I don't even think that's likely. Temperatures 89. That was our high today. Look at the temperatures now up in the panhandle. 38 Amarillo, Lubbock at 45 on the cold side of that front. We're still in the 80s to low 90s in our neck of the woods. Rio Medina 87, Seguin 85. Meanwhile, 91 on the south side at Stinson Airport. Tomorrow we start the day at 55 degrees and miles per hour in terms of the wind gusts. And then by the afternoon, sunny and 78, less wind later on in the day. Low humidity the rest of this week. Another cold front Thursday night, early Friday gives us another chance of some scattered showers and storms. But overall, highs near 80 the rest of the week. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, what a finish in the dome <laughs> on Saturday. <laughs> you got a new nickname for him. If cardiac road runners, yeah. I mean, if nothing else, I, I feel like every game we're going to have a heart attack. It's almost like they spot themselves a difficult situation only to work their way out of it. But that's not the case. They just came back and gave us the best finish in college football this past weekend. What a final drive and what a game winning touchdown. We'll show it to you when we come back here. And after the latest loss. Frank Harris has been named the Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week for the fourth time following the UTSA Roadrunners' dramatic number behind last-second victory over North Texas to remain undefeated in league play. Harris was responsible for 313 yards of offense and included two touchdowns to help lead the Roadrunners to a 31-27 homecoming victory. It was the final drive that produced the most exciting finish in college football this past weekend. It included a one-handed catch by Oscar Cardenas on fourth down and two, and then Harris delivered the game winner with just 15 seconds left when he was able to find DeClorian Clark. Winners of five straight games of road orders are now bowl eligible six and two overall four and zero in Conference USA. It's a great win. We still got more to come. Uh, I'm proud of uh, Coach Taylor for his 200th win. I know it meant a lot to him. <clears throat> we went out and did it in dramatic fashion. It means a lot to us. Um, bowl eligible. Um, just going out there executing. You know we're both at the top of the conference. And, uh, you know, heading into the bye week definitely means a lot for us. So definitely going to learn from this, keep growing, and there's still a lot of football left. Now, Frank mentioned that the Roadrunners get a much-deserved bye week, a week off, if you will, this weekend to help heal some of the injuries and get this Roadrunners only received by the way one vote in the latest Associated Press College Football Top 25 rankings. Texas Longhorns have fallen out of the top 25 in college football after their 41-34 loss to the Cowboys at Oklahoma State. That was after the Horns were able I owe an apology to Longhorn Nation. Uh, I, uh, I made a mistake at the end of the game and not seeing in the eyes of Texas when the game was done. Um, that was not anything intentional. That was not anything that had to do with our players. I think our players just followed me up the ramp into the locker room. Uh, obviously upset by the way the game ended and uh, literally walked off the field. So I apologize to everybody for that. That'll never happen again. The best the fight in Texas Aggies can do this season is now finishing 8-4. and four. This after their unexpected loss on the road to South Carolina on Saturday night. The Aggies were knocked out of the heels right out of the gate when Xavier Leggett took the opening kickoff all the way back 100 yards for a touchdown. The Maroon and White giving up 17 points in the first six minutes of this game. The Aggies were their own worst enemy at back. Teams. Believe in our kids. Have a lot of faith in our players. Have a lot of faith in what we're doing. And uh, it's got to keep coaching them, and they will get there. Their, their heart, their fight, their soul, and we just got to get them to execute a little better in the beginning and all the way through some key situations on both sides and special teams and get there. But hey, we're not where we want to be. No one's happy, I promise you that. But we just got to play better and finish it off. The people in power of A&M that control the money would not buy him out with over $80 million. They owe him now 85 if they buy him out at the end of this season. They would do it, but I think he gets one more year. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And having talked to him when he's been annoyed in the past, Greg, you would know what that sounds like. <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Greg. Still to come here at 6 o'clock, KSAT explains the Latino vote. Those three words key every election cycle. But there are stereotypes and misconceptions. Our team sharing some really eye-opening perspectives up next.
early voting now underway in the midterm elections. No matter who or what is on the ballot, you hear about the importance of Latino vote every election cycle. But are there misconceptions about what that means or how the Latino vote is perceived? Here's RJ Marquez and Alicia Barrera for KSAT Explains. Benny Resendiz and Jackie Baldoso are San Antonio natives, raised only about 10 miles apart, yet in what many would consider two worlds apart. I grew up here in Alamo Heights. Alamo Heights, zip code 78209, is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in San Antonio with a median household income of more than $147,000. Baldoso grew up on the city's south side, just off Nogalitos. In my statistics class in high school, we actually did a project on zip codes in, in San Antonio. Zip code 78225, a median income of about $63,000 enlisted as one of the poorest neighborhoods in San Antonio. We were watching the news and we're seeing that people in Alamo Heights were getting brand new iPads for every one of their students. Every classroom had a Promethean board, while my classroom didn't even have air conditioner. Both Latinos will make their choice at the ballot on November 8th, guided by their own experiences. My family has always been Democratic for as long as I can remember. I consider myself a moderate Republican. Resendiz is a first-generation Mexican-American raised by his mother and grandmother. When they moved here to the States in the 80s, they were here undocumented. And due to President Reagan's amnesty, they became legal citizens. So they have forever been grateful to President Reagan and the Re Republican Party for making them citizens. He proudly carries on that political identity. I just feel like their message on economic values, social responsibility, goes with my Hispanic values as well, as being responsible and providing for your family. According to a recent study by the Pew Research Center, 80% of Latino registered voters this year say economy is one of the most important issues when deciding who to vote for. But Baldoso says it's also about the candidate's background or understanding of the struggles faced by low-income Latino voters. They'll understand our issues much better and they can make better decisions. Other top issues include health care, abortion, and immigration. And while their views are different, both Latinos agree neither political party truly understands the Latino vote just yet. I think Latinos, along with any other minority, don't want to be tokenized. We want to be talked as if you were talking to white people. I believe that many Hispanic vo voters have been hesitant to vote because they felt as if their voting doesn't matter, as if their vote doesn't count. You know what, let's do this one. Let's do the lap. Let's do it too. That belief is why it took Stefan Delgado more than a decade to cast his first vote. And I started to realize things that mattered to me and things that were important to me, but I wasn't doing anything about it. But now he is doing something about it by not only voting, but helping others do the same. Texas is becoming more and more um, Latino populated and we have a voice, but I think a lot of times we weren't utilizing. As a deputy registrar, he sets up shop at local businesses and welcomes anyone who wants to register to vote. This election cycle has been a lot of uh, younger voters, a lot of young female voters. So, I mean, you can tell where that direction is going with young female voters is, you know, women's rights. While we were talking with Delgado, he registered Justin De Hoyos, another San Antonian who was told growing up that his vote didn't mean much. This is kind of beaten into me. It's kind of drilled into you that this is what it is. Is when you work with people like Steve, you know, Stefan, and you're on the ground level, you know that doesn't, that's not true, that's not the case. Which is why you have situations like today where he's stepping up, you know, providing resources and just bridging the gap. We need to quit thinking that people are going to come find us. We need to do a better job of putting it in front of people and saying, this is what's coming up, this is what's important, this is how you vote, this is how you get registered. Stefan wants to send the message that the Latino vote does count, no matter the differences in what individual Latino voters care about the most. We care about the economy, we care about jobs, and we also, like my grandmother's situation, we care about the border crisis. And Latinas alone are expected to be more likely to show up at the polls for their views on abortion. Many of us understand that it's important to ensure that our rights to maintain our health and our privacy are are there. However, will it be enough to awaken a potentially sleeping giant, an estimated 6.2 million Latinos old enough to vote in Texas this year? I believe that the Latino voice is going to get only stronger for upcoming generations in America.
What does the Latino vote mean to me? It doesn't mean what it used to mean. To me, it means progress. To me, it means generations of sacrifices from people before me. There are absolutely misconceptions about the Latino vote. It doesn't mean we vote in, in one particular way. Lots of people mistakenly see the Latino group, voting group, as a monolith, and that is definitely not the case. I think, I think one of the biggest common misconceptions is that we're all Democrats, and I think it is fact fracturing. Not every Latino, not every Mexican is Catholic. Um, not every Latino speaks Spanish. Not every Latino cares about the border. That we all have the same thought process, um, that we all came from the same place, uh, that we all have the same culture, the same heritage, and it is absolutely not like that. Now, if I go to family gathering, I'm going to hear a lot of different views. My father, God bless him, he would vote every single well, maybe not every election, not necessarily every local election, uh, but he would always vote for president. That was, uh, he almost felt it, it was his honor to be able to vote. I think that oftentimes they focus on the Latinos when it's campaign season, but in my experience, and my family's experience, um, we often say that we feel forgotten in the in-between. My father is, is not from here, he's from El Salvador. He is, um, you know, uh, never been able to vote. And one thing that meant a lot to him was a promise that as soon as we turned 18, that we were going to vote. When I think of the Latino vote, I think of the sleeping giant because a lot of times Latinos don't act because yeah, they don't think that their vote matters or they don't think that the candidate truly, truly cares for them. This, this election tier uh, gears more towards Latinos, it, every election does. We now have a voice and it's a very powerful voice. You can scan the QR code you see right here to take you to the KSAT Explains page where you can find all the stories we have done so far. A new topic every single week. Look for another KSAT Explains Mondays right here on the News at 6. We'll be right back. The midterm elections just 15 days away. Politicians from both parties blitzing the campaign trail as many states start early voting like here in Texas. A new ABC News poll shows Republicans expanding their lead on key issues like the economy and crime, while voters favor Democrats to handle COVID-19, climate change and abortion. In the Senate, Republicans only need one seat to gain a majority. Tonight, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his Democratic challenger Charlie Crist will face off in their only debate with DeSantis favored to win the governorship in Florida. The day is counting down for the 10th annual Dia de los Muertos Festival that is happening this weekend. It's a tradition that celebrates the lives of our loved ones through various different ways, like an altar. It's a display built with symbols and items that remind you of those who have passed and a way to welcome home the souls of the dead. This year, the family and friends of Maria Ibarra are coming together to create an altar in her honor. She died last year, and those who knew her say she'd loved to entertain. She was always into theater. Her first play was in high school, where she either didn't speak at all or only had one line. But after that, she fell in love with it. A lot of beautiful remembrances over the next few days. Muerto Fest is happening this Saturday and Sunday at Hemisphere Park. KSAT crews will be there on site Saturday to record a primetime special that airs Sunday at 8 p.m. For more information, go to KSAT.com. We'll be right back. All right, we're talking about the forecast, and we got a lot to talk about because some big changes, starting with a cold front, Adam. Yeah, the cold front hits in just a few hours. I mean, I think be, by 10 o'clock it's going to be here in the metro area and you're going to notice some changes, particularly in terms of the wind behind that cold front. Now, a few storms, yes, are possible tonight, especially between 9 p.m. and midnight. I think the coverage is going to be very limited, so only a few of us getting some of the rain and even the rainfall accumulations should be pretty low as well due to the fast pace of these storms. The made headline, the bottom one here, becoming very windy 
with non-thunderstorm wind gusts. Let's take a look at the rain chances here. By 8 o'clock, 20%, 9 p.m. through midnight, we're only talking about a 30% chance, so very limited coverage across our area. Here's the big picture, and right now, the main severe weather threat is still far to the north of us, and that's where it's going to stay through the night, particularly between San Angelo and Waco. They've already had some severe thunderstorms uh, that have developed there further north along this cold front that's moving in. This cold front's moving fast. It's already moving into Val Verde County, and again, it's it's going to be here probably by 10 o'clock. As for the future cast, I think this gives us a good illustration of what to expect in terms of showers and storms on the radar. 8 o'clock, a little bit of activity in the hill country. 9, 10 o'clock, a broken line potentially stretching from Austin south down I-35 into San Antonio, maybe even into Frio County. And then by 11 o'clock and midnight, that activity moves east of here, particularly the eastern counties. Lavaca County, Gonzales County, DeWitt County, even Carnes County, and that's where we could actually see some better rainfall, better rainfall coverage, more numerous showers and storms farther east of San Antonio with better potential of accumulations of a half inch to an inch. But locally, I, you know, San Antonio, Bear County and surrounding counties, I really don't anticipate much in terms of the rainfall for us. Let's talk temperatures and wind. Wind out of the south right now at 11 miles per hour. Not a big deal, pretty typical breeze. Gusting at times 20 miles per hour locally, that's about it. But as the cold front moves in, locally and in the hill country especially, we'll have these wind gusts late tonight and through sunrise tomorrow morning, 40 to 50 miles per hour. You can see Concan, 7 a.m., about 54 miles per hour. New Braunfels, 50 or 45. Canyon Lake, I mean, this is just a computer model, but this is in line with our thinking. Canyon Lake, 57 mile per hour gust, not out of the question. So very early tomorrow morning, we'll have the highest wind gusts and then the wind will gradually subside into the afternoon. Still 10 a.m. gusting to 40 miles per hour. And then afternoon, those winds will pump the brakes and actually turn calm by tomorrow night. Here's another way to look at it with those wind gusts peaking early tomorrow morning, 54 miles per hour. Even locally, we could see some of those gusts that high. So a few power outages are possible. Whenever you have winds like that, even if it's not a thunderstorm, you could have some localized power outages. And here's another main thing secure Halloween decorations. I think that's going to be a bigger issue than power outages will be the blow ups and inflatables blowing down the street. All right, temps right now 80s to near 90 locally. Bandera at 85. Tomorrow morning we start the day in the mid 50s. By the afternoon we top out upper 70s to right near 80. Basically a return to fall light conditions the rest of this week and by Wednesday morning as low as 49. So have that jacket ready again. Another shot of rain Friday morning. 49. Mm -hmm. I like it. In case you missed it, coming <laughs> up next. <laughs>it is monday that would be october 24th the twisted metal left behind only hints at the damage done to two men when their car and motorcycle collided on blanco road near wilderness oak after 11:30 last night the 21 year old motorcyclist already was dead from his injuries the man who was driving the car was trapped inside firefighters had to work to free him then rush him to a hospital the report says in addition to making the illegal turn the 63 year old man in the car also was suspected of driving while intoxicated he faces charges once he's released from the hospital. Another school shooting leaving a St. Louis campus in mourning. Two were killed by a gunman before police took down the shooter. It all happened just after 9 o'clock this morning at a visual and performing arts high school there. Police say the shooter, who is in his 20s, broke into the locked down campus, shot and killed a woman as well as a teenage girl. Six others were shot. They're being treated for their wounds. Rackspace Technology leaving the old Windsor Park Mall. It renovated back in 2008. The chief marketing officer for the company says it plans to move its operations to Ridgewood Plaza 2, which is off of 281 near Redland Road. While the move is set to happen sometime in 2023, no official date's been set. Tonight's Powerball jackpot is now up to $610 million. It is the eighth largest jackpot in Powerball's 30-year history. The jackpot crossed the $600 million mark after no ticket matched all six numbers on Saturday night. The $610 million prize has a cash value of about $292 million. The drawing is at 10 p.m.
time here at 6. We'll see you on the night beat at 10.